Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Carter Capetz, and today I'll be sharing with you guys the research that I've done throughout high school, and then also some ways that I can see re uh, high schoolers being able to engage in research. Uh, <laughs> so my first research experience started last year in ASI when I decided to study sustainable polymers. And this was mostly motivated because I was really inspired by the chemistry course I had taken the previous year. And I also wanted to tie in my value of environmentalism. And so discovering plastic alternatives seemed like the perfect place to start my work. For some motivation and goals of the research, we all know that plastic pollution is detrimental for the environment. It really hurts all sorts of ecosystems. And one key thing that I want everybody to kind of walk away with, walk away from this talk is that recyclability is something that needs to be initially designed into a material. So for example, you can't take a plastic bag and do something to it to make it recyclable. Materials have to be designed to be recyclable in the first place, and so that's why research into alternatives to plastic is so important. So the main goal in this research was, one, to explore green chemistry, something I hadn't really explored to begin with, and also this being my first research experience, I wanted to try to figure out you know, how I could fit into the equation of research as a high schooler. And I also wanted to make sure that this opportunity was mostly used for learning. So I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I wasn't so worried about revolutionizing anything or making any completely new material. I'm sure there's high schoolers out there who can go out and make major changes to the world on their first steps. But I wanted to take a little more cautious of a first step. So my priority was to learn as much as I could to begin with. So the specific type of plastic alternative I looked into were sustainable polymers. And basically, you can think of a polymer as a long chain of a bunch of small parts, and those small parts are called monomers. And the specific type of polymers or the polymerization that I employed was something called ring opening polymerization, which is just present in a lot of research for sustainable polymers. And the monomers that I selected were naturally occurring, so ones that you can find in fruits, uh, and also our, like the production of these monomers are quite friendly to the environment. And so the specific monomers I selected were delta decalactone and L-lactide. So this is kind of a, the main chemical equation of the research that I looked at. So we can see delta decalactone, the original monomer here, and I polymerize it. So that ring that we see here kind of gets opened and th th those repeat on and on to make this long polymer. The only problem with this polymer is that it ends up being a liquid, so in order to kind of instill some of those uh, mechanical properties that I would want inside of this material, I added on L-lactide end blocks to create this final polymer. And those are some pictures of what the lab procedure kind of looked like. So for the results of this research, I was able to successfully create the polymer that I set out to create. And I was really lucky to be able to present my findings not only like locally, but also when the ASI class got to travel to the UK. It was really fun to present some of these findings to students that, are, that were similar, uh, similar ages. And also just through this year of experience, I gained a much better understanding of research, what research was like. I really had no idea what I was walking into in the beginning of ASI, so I felt like I learned a lot. And I realized that research was something that I really cared about, and so I was really excited to keep on pursuing it into the summer. I applied to a bunch of summer programs, and I ended up being able to continue my research at UC Santa Barbara. And I, at UC Santa Barbara, I kind of took a turn in a completely different direction where I studied tensorized neural networks, which is a little bit different. So just for some motivation and goals, when I walked into the summer, I, want, I knew I wanted to study something challenging and something different than I had before. And then also, last year, or in the previous year, I had used the opportunity to learn as much about myself and how I fit into research. So this time, I wanted to see if I could actually try and make a meaningful contribution to the scientific community. So basically, what that meant was that I was going to try and find an area specific enough where I could actually try and improve upon the existing research of professionals. And the problem that I ended up selecting to try and solve was solving difficult problems on, um, on devices that have limited resources. Um, so a quick example of this can be seen on, like, uh, on edge or embedded processors on autonomous vehicles. We know that autonomous vehicles, in order to actually be able to drive on their own, is an extremely difficult task. And there's a lot of calculations. There's a lot of problems and equations that they have to solve. 
But the thing is, all those little processors all over the car don't have that much memory. They don't have that much computational power. So it kind of raises the question, how can we efficiently solve these sorts of uh, equations, run these predictions, all on a device that is very small and very limited in power? So some of the work that I did, I can just go over it quickly because it's a little specific. But this is a simplification of the main neural network that I had created. These were some of the key equations that I was looking at throughout the research. Um, and it was cool. I was able to create a poster of my findings and also write a paper that I'm working on publishing. And I ended up being successful in my goal of trying to contribute to the scientific community. I had taken a pretty significant step forward from what I'd seen in existing research, which was really cool. Um, but when it came time for me to share my findings, even if it was just with other members at this program or with the ASI class back in Los Altos, I realized it was a little bit difficult to share what I had done just because of how specific it ended up being. And so with that learning, I'm moving into this year to study uh, synthesis of those of my previous two research experiences, which is looking into uh, solar cells or perovskite photovoltaics. And so this, the main goal I have is one to try and find a balance between making meaningful contributions to the scientific community whilst also being closely connected to the impacts of my work. So when I did work on like the uh, solving difficult equations on resource constrained devices, it was hard to explain to people how connected I was to the actual impacts of the research. So I wanted to kind of move a little bit closer towards that side. And also this provided a really good opportunity for me to synthesize my interests in both material science and computer science. Uh, so just some kind of explanation of what this all means. Um, perovskites are this material that have kind of shown themselves to actually be improvements over the traditional silicon uh, semiconductors that are used throughout solar cells that we see right, like see in the modern day. The only problem is that they're far from optimized to be able to actually be put into the real world. So what I want to do is try and use computer science and specifically machine learning to help me optimize the process in order to help me initiate and put these perovskites into actual scalable manufacturing for the real world. Uh, and that's kind of like what a workflow can look like. So this kind of allows me to move into what, how a high schooler can engage in research. And so I think there's three main keys for high schoolers to be able to participate in research effectively. And the first step is to really try and foster a curious mindset. Uh, this is, I, I think, a key thing, not only inside of research, but just throughout any intellectual exploration. I think it's, in, it's very important for people to develop a curious mindset. So wherever you go, if, whether you're in class or listening to a podcast or whatever it may be, being used to finding questions, finding things that you, you don't 100% understand, and being comfortable you know, chasing down the answers to that. For me, fostering a curious mindset also kind of looked like drawing inspiration from all sorts of places. One place that I really like to draw inspiration from is uh, sources of media. Growing up, I had loved watching all sorts of chemistry or um, chemistry or computer science videos on YouTube. And so that kind of helped me feel comfortable moving into research as a high schooler. Secondly, once you kind of get used to answering these questions and chasing down answers, you're bound to reach you know, resources, articles, papers written by professionals. And another key thing that we're taught in advanced scientific investigations, which I think is a super valuable life skill, is being used to reaching out to professionals. So there's so many articles out there, there's so many professionals out there, and they're literally just an email away. You can send so many out, you're not bound to get responses from all of them. But you know, expressing your interest in their work, saying that you know, their work really inspired you to chase down these answers, uh, can be really, really effective. You can set up all sorts of meetings and be able to chat with them and learn so much more than you ever could inside just a classroom. And finally, uh, I think it's very important to search for opportunities as tenaciously as you can. Los Altos High School, we're so lucky to have this ASI class. It's an amazing and super unique opportunity. And I'm so glad that there are you know, continual efforts to try and grow this class to make it accessible to as many people as possible. And if it's not ASI, then there's also countless summer programs out there for every, anybody to apply to, or internships throughout the year to try and conduct research uh, through those institutions or with a mentor or with some guidance. And 
you know, if you are curious enough, if you're used to chasing down answers and you are comfortable with reaching out to professionals, there's no reason why you can't pursue research individually even outside of all sorts of these programs. Uh, so with that being said, I'll be happy to take any questions. What would you say are going to be your next steps in your research if you're planning to do anything more? Yeah, so the research that I'm looking into right now is this uh, st sort of stuff with uh, solar cells. So I've been talking to this, like a few groups at Stanford to see, you know, what they're working on and how I might be able to contribute to their lab and their effort. And so uh, to go more into the specifics of this, uh, as I kind of mentioned, there's these perovskites which are uh, you know, they, they can be more efficient than what's out there right now. There's just a lot of problems with their stability and whatnot. And so this specific lab kind of looks at a very unique way of manufacturing these solar cells. And so what I'm looking to do is, you know, help contribute to them to try and optimize this process in order to make sure that we have, that we can produce the most stable uh, solar cells as possible so that they can go out into manufacturing into the real world as fast as possible. Um, is the, like, how is this going to work for uh, one-time use plastics and stuff? Uh, the sustainable polymers? So the research that I did last year, well, okay. This one, um, the main goal, as I kind of mentioned, was just mostly as a learning experience. So I didn't focus as much as I could have on the, like, actual implementation in the real world, but basically, how that that would how this research would kind of implement itself into the real world would kind of look like um, taking some more time to select other monomers within these families uh, to really customize the mechanical properties of the final material so that you can specify which kind of plastics you're looking to create a substitute for. A uh, quick question: How much efficiency? How much more efficiency are you getting out of perovskites versus silicon? Like, is it more cost effective? Uh, how like how long does it last? Oh, so for the like to answer your question about efficiency, uh, perovskites like in theory reach like um, maybe five like five or so five to ten percent higher than silicon. Uh, the only problem is actually like when you try and create a stable version of it that can last for a long time then those efficiencies go down. I know that the current research from this group, they have produced something with around 19% um, conversion efficiency. And then that's to keep in mind that the theoretical maximum for anything to convert light into like solar energy into like electrical energy is around 33%. Um, I know you, did you have any, I kind of, did you have any other parts of that question or? Okay, cool. Thank you.